Okay, thank you all for attending. This session is on the polls and how to measure public opinion. I'm very pleased to present four speakers today. You know them, but let me introduce them to you anyway. Uh, we will have Mark Baldessari, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Public Policy Institute of California. Next, Mark D. Camillo, the Director of the Field Poll. After him, Jay Levy, who is the CEO of Survey USA, and Derry Schrago, the interim director on my right of the USC College Los Angeles Times poll. What we're going to do is have a slightly different format in this panel than we did in the previous one, which is to have each of our panelists speak in that order for about 10 minutes. Uh, Jay has a presentation he will provide on PowerPoint, and the others will speak from their seats. Following each person's 10 minutes, I'll give you a brief five-minute recap with some questions and other suggestions to think about, and then we would like to open up the remaining 40 minutes to questions from the audience. So please join me in welcoming Mark Baldessari to begin. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here speaking with all of the important journalists from California today. So. Um, appreciate the opportunity. Um, I thought that I would um, keep my uh, comments um, broad on the, um, the overall context of the election and focus on a, um, a post-election survey which we conducted with 2000 November election voters um, in the days after the election um, to highlight some of the, the major themes uh, that took place in the election, um, which is consistent with um, the work of the Institute around uh, public opinion um, on elections, which is to examine the social, economic, and political trends that influence elections. And in particular, I want to point out a couple of trends that are nationwide uh, for this election, but also some that were specific to California, which resulted in election outcomes in California that look very different from, uh, from other states. Um, so uh, first of all, as, as a, an introduction, the Public Policy Institute of California conducted um, eight surveys that were related to the 2010 election, beginning in uh, December uh, 2009, then January, March, and May, all on the primary. And then uh, we, asked, we began to ask about the general election ballot, the, the gubernatorial ballot in July, and the July survey, September and October. And then, as I mentioned, we had the survey of 2000 November election voters, which we uh, conducted and then released. Um, and that'll be the, the basis of most of my comments in a report which is on our website called um, Californians and Their Government, December 2010. So from our perspective, what were the top 10 issues that um, were uh, out there influencing how voters thought about the gubernatorial election, but really the ballot overall in California? Probably first and foremost was, um, was a poor economy. And in our November uh, post-election survey, 64% um, of election voters named um, jobs in the economy as the, 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 the number one issue facing uh, Californians. And 61% uh, said that California would be facing bad economic times over the next 12 months. So that seemed to be a, a very dominant theme. Added to that, and to some degree related to that, was um, the budget crisis, which California was facing not just in the in the election year, but had been for uh, over the course of several years. And in our, um, uh, one of our pre-election surveys, we found that 90% of likely voters in, the November, in, uh, in, in California said that the state budget situation was a big problem. That was uh, near a record high. Um, also, very much an, uh, an overarching theme or, or uh, mood setting um, context um, was uh, the, uh, the legislature's um, very low ratings. The, the California legislature was experiencing um, record, at or near record low uh, level ratings consistently throughout the 2010 cycle in, in every uh, survey that we conducted. And in our, in our post-election survey, 
81% of uh, election voters said that they disapproved of the job the legislature was doing, and 79% said that they disapproved of the job that the governor, or, or they disapproved of the way the governor and legislature were, had been working together to uh, solve public policy problems. Related to that, but a broader theme involving governance was um, distrust. Uh, uh, distrust in state government at or near record lows throughout the election cycle. 14% said that they always or mostly trusted the state government in Sacramento. This was in our post from our post-election survey. 76% said the state government was run by a few big interests. 65% said that the state government um, wasted a lot of the taxpayers' money. So that was all um, very very much, uh, you know, uh, part of the, the overall theme um, in the election. Now, we had conducted a survey with the Pew Center on the states in the middle of the year um, in other states that were facing um, serious economic and uh, budget uh, issues, um, New York, Florida, Illinois, uh, and Arizona. And a lot of the themes were very consistent with what we were seeing in California. Um, so I, uh, with those four as a background, uh, which I think were, you, you could see in other states, I want to point to a few things that were different about California that ultimately, I think, uh, helped um, uh, lead to different um, outcomes. First of all, the approval rating of President Obama in California was, uh, was relatively high compared to the national polls. In our post-election survey, 54% said that they approved of the president's job performance. Um, 82% of Democrats, more than half of independents, and um, um, you know, uh, most GOP voters uh, did not approve of, of Obama, but he had you know, relatively strong support compared to what we were seeing in um, national polls. Um, in California, the, the GOP candidates faced um, the, the challenge of, of being from a party that had an unfavorable image in our Last pre-election survey, 62% said that they had an unfavorable image of the GOP. Uh, this included two-thirds of independents, eight in 10 Democrats, um, and even four in 10 Republicans said that they had an unfavorable image of the GOP. So this obviously was a very unique set of circumstances for those candidates on the ballot. Um, California um, has been, uh, so an, an, another trend, the seventh that I'll mention, and I'm coming near to the, the end of my comments here, at least my initial comments. Independent voters played a, a significant role um, in the election. They've become now about a fifth of, of the registered voters in California. And um, in our post-election survey, they swung um, for Brown and Boxer, and that made a difference in the, uh, the, the solid wins that the Democrats uh, received in a state where they don't have a majority uh, of, of voters, but they have most voters. And Latino voters in California, who from our November election survey made up about one in six voters in the electorate, um, swung heavily to, to Brown and Boxer in, uh, at, at the end of the day, were fairly late deciders as were independents, according to our surveys, but swung heavily in favor. Um, another trend that we think is, was very important and unique to California is what we would refer to as the green vote, not the green party, but, but people who, are, who have pro-environmental perspectives. You know, in the wake of the oil spill that occurred during the summer, and just in the context of a continuing support for uh, uh, clean energy and, and um, uh, regulations involving greenhouse gas emissions and, and air pollution, um, Californians um, uh, went to the polls, voted very uh, strongly uh, in opposition to Prop 23, um, the measure which would would have uh, turned back uh, or, or uh, slowed down the progress in, in, prop, uh, in AB 32. Uh, a sixth of the voters going to the poll said that they were most interested of all the propositions. They were most interested in um, Prop 23. The, by the way, the initiative that they said that they were most interested in was the marijuana initiative. That's a different kind of green initiative, um, but <laughs> not, one that, not one that we um, ultimately felt had as great an impact as the environmental um, pro-environmental stance um, in California. Um, and most Californians went, went to the polls thinking that um, 
that um, uh, greenhouse gas emission regulations would, um, would actually add jobs uh, to our economy. And, and that was, um, you know, uh, something that was a, an underlying theme. Last and not least, I want to say that Californians went to the polls, as they have in the last few years, in a reform-minded um, uh, state uh, 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 in which they were looking for ways to change um, the government, particularly the government in Sacramento. Um, they voted uh, to uh, extend, um, and government in general, they extended to, uh, to um, extend redistricting to the congressional level. They voted against um, you know, the, the effort to, to turn back um, independent redistricting. They voted to change the, the, the government budget process in a, in a couple of different ways, in three different ways, through uh, Prop 22, 25, and 26. Um, according to our post-election surveys, many Californians went to the polls uh, believing that the initiative process needed to change and the way that we go about the state and local tax system needs to change. And those feelings um, are still in evidence today and we believe ones that will carry through, um, uh, not only help explain why people made the choices they did for governor and other uh, um, ballot uh, issues in 2010, but how they're feeling about uh, what lies ahead in 2011. Thank you. Great. Okay, I'm going to do something uh, a little different. Uh, I'm going to actually talk about the public polls themselves, uh, just to open it up a little. Um, there were two things that struck me uh, most about the public polls in California in the governor's race this year. First, just the sheer number of them. There were 40 different polls taken between the June primary and the November general election. All of these public polls, and uh, you know, if you take that into, average that out over about a 20 week period, that's a, almost two polls a week, obviously wasn't evenly spread out over that period, but we'd never had as many polls before. And this doesn't even include, obviously, the many private polls and campaign polls that were being taken and some actually being leaked and distributed to the, to the press. But in this election, there were two very different types of polls being taken, uh, being taken and that's what I want to kind of center my remarks on in, this, uh, in my 10 minute uh, prepared part. The first type of poll uh, I will call the traditional telephone polls, which field is certainly apart, but I would also include PPIC, USC Times, uh, the Reuters Ipsos uh, poll, CNN Time, and there was actually one Suffolk University poll at the end of the cycle as well. All of them conducting their polls by telephone using live interviewers in a traditional way. The second was a uh, uh, growing phenomenon called interactive voice response polls, or IVR polls. These are the polls that call households using a random digit dial sample with the recorded voice of a professional announcer asking respondents to use the keypad on their phone to respond uh, to the survey. There were three uh, organizations doing these kinds of polls in California, Survey USA, which Jay Levy is here, he'll be speaking right after me. Um, also Rasmussen and his affiliates, and then also the public policy uh, polling, which is not to be confused with PPIC. Um, and if you look at the totality of the public polls, the IVR polls outnumbered the traditional polls, I think for the first time in my memory, uh, and it was a, by an, not an, an unsubstantial margin. It was 25 IVR polls taken between the primary and the general to 15 traditional polls. Well, first let me describe why this phenomenon is taking place. Well, certainly the, the primary reason um, that IVR polls are just becoming more frequent, not only here in California, but nationwide, is that they're much cheaper to conduct. And given the uh, uh, landscape of the media sponsors out there who are all running into hard times, uh, it's not hard to understand that uh, a much cheaper poll uh, uh, would have attractions to, uh, to the media uh, situation right now. But cost aside, there are some major differences that I'd just like to quickly run through and then talk about how the two sets of polls did uh, in looking at the governor's race. First, because uh, IVR polls are, are using a recorded voice rather than a live interviewer, uh, they have a, li a more limited knowledge and more limited control over who's actually being interviewed. 
The recorded voice simply just uh, instructs whoever is answering the phone uh, to indicate whether they're a voter, and if they are, they will continue uh, the survey. The method uh, also appears uh, to do away with the opportunities for the random selection of respondents within a household, which is a standard of many uh, of the traditional polls. Unlike, uh, also unlike traditional polls, IVR polls aren't able to schedule appointments with people who are not available to do the survey at the time of the call, and many don't even make callbacks. In fact, uh, the Rasmussen polls were all conducted on just a one-day period uh, throughout the uh, governor's race. Also, to my knowledge, the IVR polls only conduct, are only conducted in English. I couldn't see any reference to Spanish in any of the methodology statements. So unless I'm missing something, um, and some kind of quota sampling is being employed by the IVR polls, these methodological shortcuts must, in my opinion, uh, lead to unbalanced samples. And in fact, the Rasmussen methodological uh, statement on their website actually alludes to this. They say that many more women than men participate, uh, many more older voters than younger voters participate, many more rural than urban voters participate uh, in their surveys. A second issue that I want to talk about a little is an issue that faces all public polls, all polls in general, and that's the growing issue of cell phones. Voters are only reachable by cell phones. Uh, a 2010 field survey here in California found that 29% of all California registered voters are now receiving all or almost all of their personal calls on their cell phone. So the dimension of the problem is very large and it's growing. This uh, really presents big problems to the IVR polls, since their auto dialers are prohibited by law from calling cell phones. But to its credit, in the governor's race, a survey USA uh, alone uh, included a new feature into their last three uh, governor's race polls in which they added a second sample uh, of cell phone voters and hand dialed them uh, to tr uh, include, attempt to include these uh, cell phone only respondents. But it appears they only did that in their final three governor's race polls. I'll, I'll have Jay Levy tell me differently. Uh, but they also, since they do numerous local polls around California in all the different local races, I didn't find any reference to such uh, an additional sample of cell phones in any of their local polls. Uh, the growing number of voters who are only reachable by cell phones is also creating problems, obviously, for the traditional polls. Uh, since the RDD samples that most of us were using for so long exclude systematically all the cell phone exchanges, uh, and so they're not included, uh, some of the traditional polls have dealt with this in pretty much the same way that Survey USA has been doing, by adding a separate sample of voters uh, who are reached on their cell phone. Uh, on the other hand, others like Field and actually the LA Times USC new venture uh, actually changed their methodology away from an RDD sampling approach uh, to one where we're sampling directly off of the, the voter rolls. And this is a big advantage since uh, a lot of the uh, telephone numbers that are included along with uh, voters on the voter roll listings are cell phone numbers. Another point of departure uh, between the public polls now relates to the manner in which different pollsters also apply weights to their samples after the interviewing is completed. Most pollsters really don't disclose how they do this. But I was really struck by the major differences between what we do, I know what we do, and what uh, the Rasmussen people say they're doing on their website. Just to give you a quick summary, what Field does is we weight our overall sample of registered voters to the known population of what we believe to be the known population of registered voters by party registration, by region, by age, and by gender. Rasmussen, on the other hand, says this on their website. We construct our weights based on national trends, history, and other polls. Well, this adds a certain amount of subjectivity, I think, to their polls, and it obviously can create an array of different results from the same set of data. With all this as a preamble, let me just review. I've only got about three minutes left, but let me review what the governor's race looked like from these two different sets of polls. First, let's look at the time period in the early summer through about Labor Day or mid-September. This was a critical time in the governor's race since the Brown campaign made it a very key tactical decision not to go forward and to conserve their money. What were the public polls showing at this point? Well, during this race, there were uh, four traditional polls conducted, and none of them in this period through mid-September 
ever showed Brown losing to Whitman by a significant margin. This was a key find, and if you were just following the traditional polls, that's the message you got. Whitman was not pulling away. Yet there were 10 IVR polls conducted in that same time frame. The picture was very different and much more variable. Four of the IVR polls had Brown trailing Whitman by six to eight points. Two had Brown uh, leading by six points, and four others were within the margin of error. There was also a much more variability and less symmetry in their final pre-election polls, the IVR polls, than the traditional polls. While all the polls obviously had Brown leading in the end, uh, two of the IVR polls had Brown's lead at four and five points, and it was declining from what their same polls were showing uh, in the previous poll. To its credit, Survey USA was the only IVR poll showing an expanding Brown lead, a large and expanding Brown lead. But it was a mixed picture. With the traditional polls, all five of them, um, none of them showed Brown's lead in decline, and the three major ones, or the ones I consider the major ones here in California, PPIC, USC, uh, LA Times, and Field, all also had expanding, and the leads were larger between uh, seven and 13 points. So to conclude, the 2010 governor's race was characterized uh, by the reporting of a record number of public polls. And this was mainly the result of a record number of new uh, methodology IVR polls being added into the mix. But to me, the IVR polls are fundamentally different than the traditional polls. They gather data very quickly and inexpensively, which most likely produces unbalanced samples that require uh, um, heavier weights, more sub so subjectivity by the pollster. And in, if you look at the 2010 California governor's race, their data collectively produced more variable estimates and I think gave a less clear picture of what was going on in the race. Thank you. You are blessed. You're blessed in California to have many excellent polling firms. And we have great respect for all of those that are here. Um, Mark D. Camillo's heart is in the right place, but his analysis is short sighted and ultimately unproductive. <laughs> Let me call the first half of my remarks Fighting the Last War. To everything, there is a season. For the season for door-to-door -door interviewing has ended, and in our opinion, the sun now sets on telephone polling, all telephone polling, recorded voice and live operator. The sun rises on what will come after uh, recorded voice polling, and I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself and I apologize, this, what we call the next big thing. Many challenges confront research scientists, none greater than the danger that the profession will suffocate itself because innovation is stifled. I hope those working to develop the next big thing are permitted to breathe life into this profession that is starved for fresh thinking. Survey USA invented recorded voice polling 20 years ago. Others have copied some of what we did, and we don't defend or condemn those polls. Some are excellent, some are not. But there is as much variation across the recorded voice pollsters as there is across the live operator firms. Survey USA polls for universities, governments, agencies, nonprofits were apolitical, and I think that's why we have clients both on the left and on the right. We have polled California continuously since 1994. Recorded voice is not new. Here is 66 months of Survey USA tracking on Arnold Schwarzenegger. I show you this to illustrate that Survey USA's interest in California is neither new nor occasional. Mr. DiCamillo and Phil Traunstein would like you to believe that what Survey USA does is scary science fiction. <laughs> but it's really simple and quite elegant. Respondents who answer their ringing home telephone hear the voice of a local news anchor. If it is appropriate for us to speak Spanish, we speak Spanish. Let's see if I can make this happen. This is CBS 5 calling. I'm Ken Bastida. We're taking a free, short survey, and your opinion is important to us. Reconocemos que la siguiente pregunta es personal, pero es necesario preguntar. Si eres la... In California in 2010, Survey USA released eight tracking polls between the primary and the general election. Our final poll had the Democrat up by 11 points. To measure our performance and to study any systematic bias, 
we plot our results on a chart that looks like this. The further away from the bullseye we are, the worse we did. The more to the left or the right of the center line, the more we have something to study and fix. Here are the polls by the 13 pollsters in California who released a final poll in the California governor's race. If Mr. DiCamillo was correct and his comments today were milder than those he gave to the Sacramento Press Club immediately following the election, but in his remarks then, you would expect the recorded voice pollsters to be off the target, and you would expect the live operator pollsters to be on the target. But it is not so neat. That's a recorded voice pollster. That's a recorded voice pollster. That's a recorded voice pollster. That's an internet pollster. So yes, the Los Angeles Times, the day after the election, wrote that most of the accurate polls were done by live interviewers, but it was just as true to write that most of the less accurate polls were done by live interviewers. The person sitting on the bullseye is the Los Angeles Times USC poll, to their credit. This is our poll. Now, you could have the infinite monkey theorem and say that a monkey typing long enough will type Hamlet. That has been offered to you as an explanation for Survey USA's success. <laughs> Another explanation is to just go back and look at every governor's election since 1994, which we did. This is data. I don't know how to present data without a PowerPoint. Here's what Survey USA's findings were in those seven elections. Here's our error, 2.7 points. Each of you can now take your golf pencil and write down what you think the error is for field for those same seven elections. It should be less, right? Um, error is like an earned run average or a golf score. Lower is better. Zero is perfect. So if we had a zero error, we would have hit a perfect home run on every election. This is what we have done. These are Fields numbers. The Los Angeles Times did not ask to be in this conversation, and PPIC did not ask to be in this conversation. But there are their numbers. And you can plot them, which we did. And they look like this. There is no looking at that chart and making an argument that recorded voice has failed. You can argue that in other states, maybe recorded voice did differently. And it is the case that there is a top tier and a bottom tier, but it is not the case that all the recorded voice pollsters fall to the bottom. What about in other years besides 2010? Here's 2008. The recorded voice pollsters do not clump. They spread. The reason why Mode explains so little is that there are at least two dozen differences between the way SurveyUSA conducts its recorded voice polls and the way others conduct their recorded voice polls. Those methods matter. That is what we think we bring to it. And to portray the work that we do as the work done by a three-card Monty player is malicious. This distinction is contrived. It doesn't produce learning. It takes us off topic, and it wastes our time. I am all for a conversation about bad polls versus good polls but it is not a distinction that was drawn just a moment ago. Now I'd like to go from fighting the last war to fighting the next war. This is what I would like to have spent my time talking about today. To us, the learning in California was all about cell phones. Mark, uh, in his remarks, commented that 29% of Californians receive most or all of their calls by cell phones. So that would be a group that you would call cell phone mainlies. We drew a slightly different distinction which is the difference between CPO, that's cell phone only, and cell phone also. What we estimated from the best available government data is that 25% of Californians are CPO, cell phone only. When we buy that sample, you cannot buy a sample of just cell phone only respondents. You have to get the others with it. So that means you, if I lived in California, you would get me. I have a home phone, I have a cell phone. The cell phone sampling company might sell me, sell the, the pollster my number, and if I answered, I would be on my cell phone, thank you, but I would be a cell phone also. So 44% of the people that we interviewed in our final poll, and Mark is correct, we interviewed across the last three polls, but I'm talking now just about our final poll, were in fact interviewed. And what I wanted to talk about was the dramatic differences that we saw in those populations. So for example, Hispanics and Asians were twice as likely to be interviewed on a cell phone only as they were to be interviewed, as, excuse me, as were whites. 
And um, Asians were twice as likely as Hispanics to be interviewed on a phone that was also their cell phone in addition. Cell phone respondents were much younger. 61% of our cell phone only respondents were under the age of 34, compared to a third of our cell phone only respondents, excuse me, our landline respondents who were over the age of 65. There was a difference in how they looked at things like the Tea Party. Triple the number of the landline respondents had a favorable opinion of the Tea Party than did the cell phone only respondents. How often do you vote in midterm elections? For the landline respondents, those who said rarely were 8%, but for the cell phone onlys, triple that number. The percent that told Survey USA they had already voted, and this was in our final survey, which was conducted over six nights, the last six nights of the campaign. So it was 16% of the CPO respondents, the cell phone only respondents, compared to 35% of the landline respondents. Ultimately, we get to this, which is what matters. In our unweighted data, and Mark made some comments about what our unweighted data might look like, we have the Democrat up by nine. The way you look at this chart is I put the Democrat advantage on the left, because that's how we think about it. We were surprised, we were surprised at how different the cell phone only respondents were. 27 point favored for the Democrat. So that's an 18 point difference between the landline people and the cell phone people. We expect a difference between the cell phone mainlies but not this kind of difference. 18 points the other way, nine points in favor of the Republican. That's a 36 point spread. When we put those numbers together unweighted, we had the Democrat up by nine. Our weighting program added two points of torque and moved the number to 11, which is the number we reported, and the outcome was 12.9, so our pollster error was 1.9 points. In summary, more than ever, Innovation is needed in opinion research. The status quo, in our opinion, is a road to ruin. Innovation is not possible in a hostile environment. For the sake of those working to develop the next big thing, let us greet new approaches to data collection with open minds, not ridicule. Thank you. I'm speechless. Mm -hmm. All right, do you want to talk about polling or do you want to talk about the governor's race? I can do either one. I mean, seriously. All right. Uh, first of all, let me say I'm going to talk about the poll that everybody agrees was, the, was right. Okay, let's just acknowledge that. Um, and I'm going to give you a little background. Look, many of you know I've run a lot of campaigns. I was here in 90, I was here in 94, I was here in 98. I've run three campaigns for governor. I ran two for the United States Senate. I ran the assembly campaigns for the Democrats for uh, four campaign cycles, uh, five LAUSD bonds, three LA Community College bonds. I could go on. The point is I am a consumer of this stuff. Uh, and it was only because Dan Schnur was trying to protect uh, California from uh, corrupt politicians for a few months uh, as the interim director of the Fair Political Practices Commission that I was asked to step in as the interim director of the LA Times USC poll. I teach at SC. I used to teach at Berkeley. And so on a volunteer basis, I found myself working with Jane. Uh, and with a whole lot of other folks at the Times and at SC to come up with a poll. And you know what our objective was? It was to get it right. That's all it was. Um, this whole discussion reminds me when I ran the assembly campaigns for the Democrats. Those, I don't know if any of you are sailors or have been in the Navy, but before GPS ever existed, if you were in the middle of the ocean and you wanted to know where you were, it's called getting a fix. The rule is you need three bearings and you get a fix. Well, I when I was running the assembly campaigns, hired three different pollsters and used all of them in the same districts, and I figured that in the middle was the truth. Uh, and that's kind of what you've seen here. Um, we worked very long and hard uh, at the Times poll uh, to try to get it right, and, and I believe we did. Uh, we oversampled Latinos. I think we're, we were the only poll uh, to do that so that we had a more statistically valid measure of what Latinos were doing and thinking. On the other hand, uh, we were attacked kind of viciously, actually, by the same people who aren't going to show up at this conference. 
um, because they seemed to believe, I find this hard to believe, but they, this is what they told me, that we, we didn't weight down back to the, to the normal distribution you'd expect to see of Latinos. Uh, in, in a post-election poll, uh, we actually oversampled uh, Asian American voters, although that's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, but uh, we put a huge amount of effort into doing a, I guess, traditional, old-fashioned, low-tech poll uh, that seems to have come up with the right numbers. And I'd rather focus on what the dynamics were in the race as voters were deciding what to do than to get into a debate about methodology. And I'd like to start by pointing out that if you're a Republican, irrespective of polling, I mean, we just need to acknowledge this. Um, I would argue that the Whitman campaign was pretty dreadful and the, and the, and the Fiorina campaign was not a whole lot better. But uh, you could run a great campaign and it's very hard in California right now for a Republican to win because uh, the registration rounded off as 45, 35. Democrat, Republican, 20% independent, 5% all the cute little parties. And, and if you figure 90% of those Republicans who are roughly 30% of the electorate are going to vote Republican, that gets you to 27% of the vote. And it'll never happen, but if, if some Republican candidate manages to sweep decline to states and gets three quarters of that 20 percent, that's 15 percent. And so now you've gotten all the Republican votes and all the decline to state votes that a Republican will ever get, and that Republican is at 42. So in fairness to the women campaign and in fairness to the Fiorina campaign, it's tough to be a Republican in California in 2011. It's their own fault, but it is tough to be a Republican. We conducted three polls that I was involved in. One was after the election, and I'm not going to focus on that one. I'm going to focus primarily on the October poll. We were in the field uh, September 15th through the 21st, and then we were in the field um, from October 13th uh, through the 20th. And, and very briefly, um, and you can explore this or not in the Q&A if you want to. Look, the starting point for this campaign is you had a lot of really unhappy voters. I mean, the wrong track question in California was getting about an 80% wrong track. Um, that's pretty dismal. That's a pretty unhappy electorate. And normally, those of us who are in this business, and that includes a lot of people in this room, uh, I think we would expect that voters would be taking to the streets uh, with, with torches ready to burn the place down figuratively, if not literally, when you see that kind of wrong track. We had a recall when the numbers were like that. We had Prop 187 when the numbers were like that. You had Prop 13 when numbers were like that. And what intrigued us as we were putting together the LA Times USC poll was, was that the voters did not seem to be taking to the streets. So in the September poll, we asked the 80% of respondents who said they thought that the state was headed in the wrong direction, we said, which word best describes your emotions about how things are going in California? And we offered them four choices, plus they could volunteer a choice. Um, we said, are you hopeless? 7% said they felt hopeless. Um, and uh, are you afraid? 8% said they were afraid. We asked, are you angry? 20% said they were angry. But the overwhelming answer, 55% said they were disappointed. And so uh, I certainly uh, had felt going into that poll, came out of that poll feeling that what was going on with voters as the election was taking place was that they were curled up in a fetal position, clinically depressed, uh, and when you think about it, it's fairly obvious why that would be true. We had elected a governor in 2003 who said he would change things and blow up the boxes and make everything better, and he failed dismally. Uh, his approval rating uh, by the time this election was held wasn't much better than the legislature's. And we had elected a president of the United States who certainly said he would change things and, in fact, personifies change. And most voters, although in California they liked him, didn't think he was doing a great job. So number one... Um, we had a pretty clinically depressed electorate. Number two, the, uh, the president, notwithstanding the Republicans' wishes and hopes and desires and dreams late at night, uh, is pretty popular in California. Uh, his job approval uh, amongst everybody was a nine to the positive. Uh, Decline to states, it was 31 to the positive. Latinos, it was 27% to the positive. 
There was talk about an enthusiasm gap. All of us on the inside who live inside the Sacramento Beltway or whatever the equivalent is, where, where there was a lot of buzz about Democrats are not enthused, whatever that meant. Well, I can tell you by October that we asked people how enthused they were, and it was even. Jerry, ba Jerry Brown's favorables were basically even. Meg Whitman became, and this is one of the headlines, extremely unpopular over the course of this campaign. Now, you remember I ran the Checky campaign, right? And the Checky campaign was a campaign, with all due respect to Al, uh, in which Al Checky spent $40 million of his own hard-earned money and wound up less popular than if he had spent nothing. Well, Meg Whitman managed to quadruple that. Uh, Meg Whitman became extremely unpopular uh, with likely voters in the, fall, in the October poll. She was at 37.52. You'd think 100 and whatever, $40 million would buy you something better than that. In October, the vote was 52.39 amongst all voters. Uh, Jerry was getting 80% of Democrats, which is what you'd expect. She was getting about 77% of Republicans, kind of what you'd expect, but he was killing her with declined estates by 37%. Uh, and with Latinos in September, uh, because she had openly courted Latino voters and put a lot of money into Spanish media, uh, the spread was only 55 for Jerry and 35 for Meg, which was actually a narrower spread than you would expect to see amongst Latinos in California who really don't feel very welcome in the Republican Party. Uh, and, and by the time that we polled in October, that 20-point spread uh, for Jerry had increased to 34 percent in the wake of the incident over the firing of Nikki and her, her statement in the Spanish language debate to a uh, honor student from Fresno State, as you all know, that no, that student shouldn't be allowed to go to college. Uh, her, uh, her, she was losing declined estates, as I say, by about 37%. In the final poll that we did, we asked descriptives, I think most of you in the room are familiar with the descriptives, we, at, we, we give them a, a series of things, and we say, well, does this, does this describe Jerry Brown or does it describe Meg Whitman? And we put in the October poll a descriptive we don't normally use. I don't think I'd ever used it in my career, and that is who tells the truth. We thought that would be pretty compelling. And sure enough, uh, Brown uh, beat her on who tells the truth by 20 percent, and amongst Latinos by 31 percent. Uh, more typically, we say who understands the problems of people like you, and Brown was ahead with all voters by seven. That's an empathy measure, obviously. Brown was ahead by 17 points with all voters in October. And amongst Latinos, he was ahead by 36 points. On every descriptive we used, Brown was doing very, very well. Who will be decisive? Who has a clear plan for what to do? Even on who has the energy to stay on top of the job, which was like getting at, is he too old? Uh, she did not have an advantage there. Uh, who would do a better job on immigration? Jerry Brown, with all voters, by 11 points. Who would do a better job on taxes? That would be her natural plus. Jerry Brown, by two points, with all voters. Who would do a better job on the economy? She was winning that one by a total of four points. Uh, on the question of did they want somebody experienced or somebody who was an outsider, that was a close call. Uh, throughout the campaign, voters were very unsure about that one. Latinos ultimately decided that they wanted experience rather than an outsider. So that's a quick roundup of some numbers, all of which say what I think I said at the beginning of this, which is they ran a really bad campaign uh, in an environment where um, it's tough to be a Republican. Uh, the Whitman campaign managed by the end of the campaign as people were voting to have no advantage whatsoever among anybody other than Republicans. Now, I'm not interested in placing blame, and they're not going to be here to defend themselves, but uh, I've run good campaigns and bad campaigns, and if you want a textbook of a campaign that was not a good campaign, uh, we certainly have an example from the gubernatorial race in 2010. Thank you. Thank you, Derry. Uh, I'm going to make a few comments and 
suggestions for ways that we might want to think about our discussion and then open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, thank you all for your very interesting and provocative talks. Um, let me just begin by saying that I am affiliated with the USC, and we like to call it the USC Los Angeles Times poll, not the other way around. Um, uh, as there, I am the research director of that poll, and um, I should note, um, Jay, when you put up your data, those were earlier uh, surveys done by the Los Angeles Times that were not affiliated with USC, so all the bad ones were done before us. Uh, but this, this is our very first poll with uh, USC College and the Los Angeles Times. Hopefully we will continue to produce uh, good results. Um, I want to make two points. Um, one, the first is about, it, the sp first speaks to the question of the distinctiveness, and in particular uh, will incorporate comments made by all four of the panel members. And the first point that I want to make is just to observe that these distinctive methods yield different strengths, right? They yield different types of data. They each have their strengths, and it depends on, in some ways, what we are, what we are after. Uh, the methods have to match what it is that you want to do with it. So for example, SurveyUSA's strength is, in, in many ways, I think, the ability to run uh, polls uh, inexpensively, to do a lot of them, and to do them over the course of the entire election cycle at regular s intervals without breaking the bank. Um, at the same time, however, and I'm not sure what the average length of poll is for you, Jay, uh, the average amount of time that you keep, that a respondent will stay on the line with an electronic voice, or rather a pre-recorded voice, but I imagine it's much shorter than the typical time that a respondent will stay on with a live interviewer. So in this respect, and to the extent that that is true, uh, what we have is Survey USA data and the data that are gathered by RVR technology to be very good at a snapshot. They're good at one thing. One, and they may be quite good at it indeed, and that would be to give us an answer on who's going to win or who's ahead. It gives us a good sense of what the horse race might be. However, what traditional polls that actually use live interviewers and speak with people and keep nudging that respondent along to stay with them and complete the questionnaire and ask the questions are something else altogether. Uh, surveys that are done in particular with human beings that where one is engaging in an actual conversation with a respondent, that is really where the rubber meets the road in survey research. Where you find public opinion is when you have that conversation. And to the extent that we do that, then horse race polling is just one aspect of what live interview technology does. Live interview technology allows us to ask other kinds of questions, deeper questions, ones that we might not be able to accomplish equally as well, though I think that innovation in IVR technology perhaps would allow us to get there, particularly as people become more and more used to communicating with, uh, with each other by text or by Facebook, for example. Nevertheless, the point still stands, which is at present there are distinctive methodologies that have different strengths. And in particular, surveys that are done, for example, by these three public polls you see represented here, give us the following things that uh, IV, IV our polls do not as strongly. Public polls allow us to say why the outcome was the outcome. They give us a sense of what the explanation ought to be. Why are people behaving and thinking in the way that they are? They also help us to analyze, allow us to give analysis for what we might expect in the future from voters. And finally, they allow us to improve our methods, which is not to say that we can't improve methods with the other technology, but what we cannot do is engage in a lot of quality control over the voice, uh, voice recordings. We do have supervisors uh, we, listening to questions or to interviewers. We do have responses from, interview, from respondents who say, I don't understand this question. This question doesn't make sense. And it eventually will get back to us. Perhaps there will be a way to include a comment field or something in a text box or a recording uh, for that technology. So my first point, the takeaway, as we've heard these variations in the technology for polling, the first thing I think to take away is that different methods uh, have quite different strengths, where uh, the less expensive, quicker polls will be able to give us a sense of the pulse, but not tell us that much more about the health of the patient, in this case, what the person is, uh, what the uh, background and the things that are propelling them to have these opinions are. 
The second thing that I, point that I wanted to make, and then I will stop, is that methods and analysis of po polling need to match the population of interest. And as I look out into this room, this room doesn't really look very much like the California electorate. This room looks like the California electorate, maybe not before the 19th Amendment, because there are some women, many women in this room, but this room looks like the California electorate from 1965 or 1960. And that's not the reality of the California electorate any longer. So when we think about methods of analysis to match the population of interest, we need to pursue much more strongly the notion that we have to talk to everybody. And we have to talk to everybody in a language that they understand, whether we like it or not, whether we think English ought to be the national language of the country or not. Nevertheless, it is the case that in the state of California, 30, more than a third of the population of voters, I'm not just talking about the population, I'm talking about the population of voters, more than a third of voters are non-white. You already know that with respect to the population, but they are non-white, and of that 34%, 19% and growing are Latino. Of those 19% of registered voters who are Latino, more than a third of them speak Spanish as a first language and therefore, are, and as a result, were foreign born. The, the numbers for Asian Americans are even more stark. Asian Americans make up 13% of the population of California and an ever-growing proportion still within the context of registered voters. They make up 7%. 80% of Asian Americans are foreign born. So when we talk to voters, we need to talk to them in a language, in an, in, in an environment in which they feel comfortable speaking. So one of the things I will just say about, uh, in response to uh, some of the questions one might ask about a method of analysis needing to match the population of interest, both PPIC as well as FIELD have done and traditionally do interviews in Spanish and have also done, done interviews in Asian languages, the post-election study for the USC College Los Angeles Times poll interviewed in five Asian languages as well as in Spanish. The five Asian languages were uh, two dialects of Chinese, Vietnamese, Tagalog, and Korean. So let me just end by saying that there are distinctive methodologies and they have strengths as well as weaknesses and I think we can use to improve all of them. One of the most important things we need to do, however, when thinking about polling strategies going forward is better representing the population of voters in order to get an accurate assessment. And I, I think just as a final plug for the USC College poll, uh, that is one of the things that we did that was quite different. It is the thing uh, we did differently. We interviewed every Spanish language, uh, high po probability Spanish language speaking respondent with a bilingual interviewer. It's very expensive but it does make for a difference in getting the proper, in that, in that respect, an accurate representation of Latino voters. Um, I should also say that the governor's race was the one we did the best on. We did not do so well on the down ballots. Uh, we did not do as well on the propositions, and we, we can talk about that later with respect to having different strategies. We need to have different strategies also for analyzing our data. We may have collected it properly, but to analyze it, you can see that there's tremendous roll off from the top race to, to the propositions as well as to the lower races. I think we need different analytical strategies that I think the Times uh, USC poll will improve on going forward. So thank you for attention and let's take some questions. Uh, in the back, is there a microphone? I, I'm not sure this is appropriate, but I've always wondered, I mean, why do we need the polls? We have elections. <laughs> well, I think if I can just take a stab at that. This on? Um, the polls are going to be done by the candidates. So I view the value of public polls is to hold up the mirror that the candidates and their strategists and everybody inside the campaign is seeing and just allowing the public the opportunity to see exactly what's going on, and that's really the idea of why we do them. I would, uh, 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 you asked a very good question. Look, we're, there, we're, there are gonna be public polls for the reason that you just said, Mark, because there are private polls. I mean, that's how we make decisions in campaigns. I mean, you know, again, the discussion here is about public polls, and we can argue all day long about methodology. When you're sitting there and your rear end's on the line because you're running a campaign, you want data that's right, which is why I said I use three different pollsters. Um, 
The issue that underlies what you asked, though, is the which we have not addressed and probably won't in this discussion, is the extent to which these public polls affect how voters vote. Uh, and that's a very important question and a fair question. And it's why I think that, that all of us up here, and I think all of us take this very seriously, uh, have to do a good job because you, you, know, you can't do what these polls do and not wonder whether at some point you're beginning to, around the margins anyway, uh, affect the outcome. We all know, those of us who've run campaigns, that the worst thing in the world you want is to look like you're losing. I mean, the Republican campaigns beat the crap out of the LA Times USC poll, just literally beat the crap out of us, very unfairly. Um, and, and they did it because they were, in their own way, trying to say, no, you know, we're not going down the toilet. Uh, so we believe that you need the polls uh, so that the journalists in this audience uh, know from the public's perspective what the issues are and so that, um, you know, the, vote, the, 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 the candidates will be held accountable to um, discuss those issues. So hopefully in the course of conducting polls during an election, um, you're um, improving, you know, the public discourse that takes place uh, during the campaigns. As well as, of course, you know, there's always attention to the horse race, but, you know, I think beyond that, um, really the issues um, that, that might be highlighted that otherwise might not come out in the course of the campaigns. Um, can I ask? Uh, Jack? Yeah. yeah. You know, these are all very interesting presentations. And we've now heard from Darian from the first panel about what a terrible campaign, the Whitman campaign, run. But I want to ask you a question. Let's say they'd run a great campaign, OK? Could they have won, given the structural situation which Mark uh, Baldessari and Derry referred to? You got a state where, you know, it's, it reminds me actually when I think about Cal playing USC in football. Mm -hmm. You know, 40 years, we've beaten them two or three times. <laughs> uh, why is this? <laughs> they have athletes, we have students, you know? Uh, <laughs> uh, but a more, on, a more, on a more serious note, you know, on a more serious note, when, uh, <clears throat> when Stalin was told once that the Pope was pissed off at him uh, for something that the Russians had done, Stalin said, well, how many divisions has the Pope? Well, how many divisions do the Republicans have as compared to the Democrats going in? And what is sort of the persuasion potential that's out there to, to begin with? Now, the other thing, I think this something that I learned from both Marks here, is if you look at the independents in California, they're very different from the independents in the rest of the country. So, you know, the rest of the country in this 2010 election, who did the independents break for? Well, in general, for the Republicans. And so the Republicans make their gains. But the independents here are often more to the left ideologically than the Democrats. There are a lot of Latinos. There are a lot of young people. And for a variety of reasons, either ideology or because of trust in government. I mean, trust in the government doing things, which among Latinos, Mark's book has shown is greater than among other ethnic groups. So you got a situation, when people have said this before, where you're a Republican, you know, you... Um, and your question is? My question, <laughs> here's my question. My question is, is, you know, say Whitman ran a perfect campaign, whatever that is. Who knows what that would be? Uh, is there any way, seriously, given the structure of the California electorate, rather than the dynamics of the campaign, uh, she could have won? Sure, the margin could have been less. And I'm just, just curious if in your polls, you know, you can, you can get at that question. Well, I, I think absolutely, she, she had a chance. I mean, she was uh, very close. And you only need to look to who was governor most recently before uh, the end of the year. We elected a Republican in California 
you know, in our last election, it's not impossible for a Republican to win in this state. At the same time, however, uh, you're right that they're much more, even Republicans are much more to the left than Republicans elsewhere. Having said that, a couple of things in your lengthy question. One is that uh, independents are not the same as DTS voters. That's a very important uh, distinction to make. They look a lot alike, but they're not exactly the same. Um, in addition to that, any, any generalizations about Latino voters should be uh, taken with a, a large salt lick because they're very much a moving target. I think that Whitman's campaign would not have gone after Latino voters had she felt she might not have had a chance. She went after them because she thought she had a chance. And as Derry mentioned in the LA Times USC college poll data, she was doing pretty well among Latinos, better than one might have expected. Latinos uh, are still and remain, along with any other immigrant populations, non-immunized voters for partisanship. They don't come in with a party affiliation that you have to change. What they do come in with is an is a lack of knowledge about United States politics and an ability to be converted. So if I were a Republican, I would go after immigrant voters and I would go after them big because that's the one place that you can that you could much more easily convert. And once you get those immigrant voters on your side, you will have their children and the children after them. So I think there's very much a chance for Republicans. It may be not a great one, but it still exists. One, um, I, one of one of the could we have the next questions that dealing with the, the subject uh, the session on the polls? Okay. Yeah. I thought right. that, well, I Mark, thought we were about the polls. Well, I was just going to come. I'd like to, have a, I'd like to, to, to um, make Okay, let's a do something quick, this, and then we, well, well, I'd like to answer the basic campaign manager question. So you go ahead and say what you want to say, and then I'll go, I'll say something. But go ahead. Um, I'd I'd like to to say that uh, just just to add um, to the comments that have been made that under the best of circumstances it would be a long shot in the context of the fact that California had its change election in 2003. I mean, that's the way I thought about this, um, this election being very different from what was going on nationally. And having elected a Republican, and things didn't work out, the governor's disapproval rating, those ads that, that showed what Whitman was saying and what Schwarzenegger was saying that kind of linked them were in many ways uh, where the voters ended up. Um, many of whom were undecided during the summer, and then they swung um, in favor of the Democrats. But given what the, 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 the registration trends were looking like um, since the recall, the dwindling numbers of Republicans down to now about 31% or whatever it is, um, it just makes it a long shot, you know, at best. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to make a comment about ethnic voters, because I think really what's transforming California, at least in the... 30 years that I've been polling here is, is the growth of ethnic voters. And the reason that Republicans are having less and less success is just they're totally out of sync with those voters. And one thing we did this year that was different than previous years, we did four surveys, pre-election surveys, in which we interviewed in six languages. And what, what I got away from that, I mean, four Asian languages, Spanish and English, was that when you started, because we had larger samples then of these ethnic populations, there is a huge generational divide within Asian and Latino voters. And that is, I think, totally foreign to where Republican messages are, because the younger ethnic voters, whether they're Asian or Latino, are much more progressive like their peers. And I find that fascinating. They're the most conservative in terms of social issues are the older ethnic voters. I mean, Republicans seem to think that ethnic voters are traditional. They're conservative. Well, that's true of the older ethnic voters. But the younger ethnic voters, which is going to take hold in this state for the next 15 and 20 years, are not. And so the Republican message is just not penetrating to the ethnic population. And to me, until they get that into their head as to how to reach younger ethnic voters, I don't see them being successful. I think Meg Whitman had a shot in the middle of September. She was even with Jerry Brown. Ethnic voters were fairly divided. And it was, you know, if she could have just closed the sale, she could have pulled up what we would consider an upset. But it still would have been a long shot, but she was in position to, to do well, and she didn't close the deal. Let obviously. me say very quickly, 
we're forgetting something obvious. I'm the one who said that she gets all the Republicans and gets all the decline of state voters. She's only at 42. She had $140 million U.S. He had nothing. Let's be real clear about this. Let's skip all the other stuff. She spent $140 million in an election. She bought everything. She bought TV, radio, newspaper, in Chinese, in Spanish. She bought fingernail files. She may have bought a blimp. I don't know. She bought everything. And he had nothing and was saving his money until the fall. And any campaign that had a good candidate and a good strategy, and I'm not placing the blame here, should have put him away with that kind of money. It's really that simple. Thank you. Um, the woman in green, please. Thank you. My name is Laura Wells, and I was the Green Party candidate for governor in 2010. And my question has to do with what role can the polling companies play in opening up our democracy? If we've got uh, people who are angry and afraid and hopeless and disappointed, I think that if you were to do a poll and ask people, do you want to have the debates, do you want to have all the media attention focused only on the two biggest currently parties, the result would be a majority of people saying, no, we want to open up the debates. And as a matter of fact, in other states, there were 40 states that had the opportunity to have, um, where they had governor, senator, or a congressperson, where they had races that had uh, multiple parties beyond the two, 25 out of those had uh, debates that included the other um, candidates, and 15 did not. Well, 15 included California. So again, my question is, what, um, you know, because the polls end up being the reason why, or the, ex the rationale for why the, deb the debates are closed down to the two parties. So again, the question is, what role can the um, polling companies play in opening up our democracy so that we can have the kind of democracy that at least, you know, that other countries have, where there are multiple parties, multiple issues at the table, multiple solutions, lots of ideas, and ways to inspire the independent voters and other voters who've been so disappointed to um, make other choices if they would like to. Oh, you, can't, you can't blame the polls. The polls are just measuring what voters think. It's got nothing to do with that. If you, wanna, okay. if you want the Green Party to succeed or any other party to succeed, it's not a polling question. We have to end the, the binary system where we have winner-take-all legislative seats. That's, that's, it's a structural problem. All we're doing, whatever the disagreements are amongst us, is measuring what voters think. Well, the, the question is always really key. And there was, uh, you know, when I... Would I, you I, mind if we, um, if you could uh, uh, take your follow-up question another time when we have a lot of people who would like to ask a question? Yeah, but if I do want to say that, and I should have asked this as part of the question, is that if the um, question, as, as I understood from some people who were randomly selected, the question was, which governor candidate do you prefer? Jerry Brown or Meg Whitman? That, that no, was we, not the we case. Asked, that was not we, the uh, we asked uh, about the uh, Green Party and other candidates um, in all of our polls. You, you yes, were in our did. poll. You so were in our poll. You were in our poll. Thank you. Thank well, you, you for your You should go question. and look at our website. You'll, um, you'll see Up here the, in the front, name. please. Yeah. Can you wait for the microphone, please? Okay. Uh, the comments that Mark made a few minutes ago about uh, <clears throat> basically there wasn't a chance uh, for Whitman with all the things that went against her. Is this just a California phenomena, or is this something that you're seeing across the country? Is Jerry Brown been rehabilitated, or is this just uh, the circumstances of this election? Well, what's, what's really different about California is the growth of the ethnic population. It's not nearly as much across the country. So we're here, maybe it's going to happen nationally, but it will take 20 years. So we're, we're seeing it first. But uh, just the one party's ability to adapt and bring in those members and the other parties uh, just uh, 
unwillingness to bend. And I, I think that's really, uh, in my judgment, uh, the biggest reason for the downfall of the Republican Party in this state. So uh, in other parts of the country, that's not as big an issue. The, uh, the white population is, uh, is considerably larger. Even the African American population is larger. So you have different dynamics at work than you do in California. Just one addition to that, and that is uh, Mark's invocation of the ethnic voter. A hundred years ago, the ethnic voter was the Italian, the Jew, and the, the person from Ireland. And I should note that uh, if you look just at New York, look at New York alone, upstate New York and New York City is primarily Democratic Italian. You look at Long Island, it's Republican Italian. So, it, And what was the difference? It's not because Italians were, you know, sprung democratic from their loins or republican on the other hand, but instead it was the function of party mobilization and outreach to those populations in those local areas. So uh, Latinos, Asian Americans are not by definition, they don't come over here and become all of a sudden, you know, they finally discover their democratic selves. Instead, they, they come into democratic politics in the U.S. as a function of party mobilization and outreach by civic other civic groups. And to the extent, so what you can see is very different patterns. Uh, Irish and Italians and Jews are no longer systematically uh, democratic. They're everything. They're just like every other white person. A whole bunch of different things, right? And the same would be true for uh, Latinos and Asian populations or any other immigrant population. So I think I'm just seconding Mark's notion that party mobilization is the key here to bringing in uh, new populations. Um, yes, in the front, please. Hi, I'm Bob Stern, Center for Governmental Studies. I'd like to follow up on what Jay was saying. Could you go out 20 years from now and tell us, and maybe others would comment, what will political polls be at that time? Hmm. Um, I may differ from the others, but I don't think there'll be anything like what we're doing today. I think almost all of the forces uh, working on telephone polling, and I include mine in that, are headwinds, not tailwinds. People do not answer ringing home telephones anymore. I don't answer it if it's my own mother, you know, much less a pollster. <laughs> so I mean, that's just the reality. And uh, the idea that we as pollsters can just barge in unannounced, whether it's with the finest call center uh, interviewer or with the finest anchor man, and expect people to be receptive, I don't think is, has much of a future. I think most of the people in this room, although I realize it is a portrait of the 1960 California electorate, have some device on their body that they use with their thumbs, and they uh, text with it. And I think that that's really instructive, meaning if you give people a, a, a thing that they can make a phone call with, they would prefer to use their thumbs to talk. I think that a big part of how we interview people in the future will be related to their preference. Um, this will be a moment of philosophy. What people do with their thumbs is mediated communication. If I text you, I'm telling you that I have an easier time communicating with the computer who relays it to you, and then you back to the computer to me. There's a distance between us that makes me less nervous as a human. When I'm talking to you directly, which I have the ability to do on the same device, I have to be witty and clever and all these things, and I start to twitch. That's just what humans do. So mediated communication, I think, is a big future. Last point, and then I'll stop. Jane made a point about uh, live interviewing is where the rubber meets the road um, in survey research. And perhaps for the last 25 years that's been true. But if you take a distant enough perspective and you go back to US mailed things, which used to come in the mail from Nielsen and others, and that's how research was done. And now you look at the future, which is if I have a new design for this bottle, I'm going to do an internet survey and show you the design. There's no human that's talking there. So most of the research in the past, and we believe most of the research in the future, will actually not be done, orally, will not be done with people speaking directly to each other. Um, yes, the woman in, yes, right, you, you, you. <laughs> I think more people now are voting by mail or seem to, but uh, elections still seem to be run as though the last week was the only important time. So I'm wondering how you sort of bridge that gap. Um, my neighbor was just telling me, she said, I'm getting all of this mail, but I already voted. So that's a waste of money, right? Yeah, uh, the, the line I use on that is we don't have election day, right? We have 30 election days. 
uh, campaigns know that and, and try to accommodate it. When, when I was running campaigns in the 80s and early 90s, you took the amount of money you had to spend and backed it out from election day, right? And you started uh, at the point where you knew your money would last. Uh, it is much more complex now because you clearly have to affect voters who are voting as many as 30 days out. And then there are people who've already voted, and, and you know, we used to have last-minute surprises, right? We'd, we'd do something amazing on the last weekend when the, when the opponent could, we'd launch some amazing charge when the opponent couldn't respond. And you can't do that kind of last-minute surprise thing with the same effect. So um, uh, uh, campaigns uh, accommodate that now as best they can, but it also obviously affects polling. And, and so, again, we polled in September, we polled in October. And, and before uh, our October poll was done, people who had already started to vote, and so we asked people whether they'd already voted to determine whether there were differences between people who had not yet voted and who had voted. I want to make a related point, and it has to do with turnout. Um, this was an election in which um, there was a lot of, a lot of noise, um, uh, especially um, in the early fall, about how there were all these uh, voters who were you know, not interested in voting and so forth. But the fact that so many people are getting mailed their ballots, you know, um, and so many people have now taken up the opportunity of voting by mail, you know, this election surprised people on the upside in California, I think, in terms of the turnout, the special elections we've had uh, also. You know, I was uh, talking with somebody yesterday about the special election we're planning, you know, that we expect to have in June. Uh, they said, oh, it'll be a low turnout. I said, don't expect it'll be a low turnout. There's so many people now who are getting just automatically getting their ballots mailed, and um, that's just become part of the uh, of the process. Um, and that has changed, um, uh, I think, in a positive way, the amount of, of, of voter engagement in, in elections because so many people are taking up that um, that ability to to take their time and but you know participate. Um, far left in the back. Yes. Yes. question about cell phones. I want to know if the rest of you accept Jay's estimates of cell phone only, cell phone plus, and if each of you feel that your polls accurately either capture or wait up for the effect of those cell phones. And if Jay, if you want to repeat what your actual percentages were. Just to, be, just to be clear, nothing of ours but data that we get from the National Institutes of Health, which is the keeper of such data, estimates that 25 percent nationwide and growing, it's probably much higher by, by the time I'm done with this sentence. Uh, and, uh, so that's what we're basing ours on. So you're not using a specific California measure? As, to my knowledge, there is not data that the government maintains in California. Uh, there is state by state data, but that data is old, a year and a half old that I think. So well, yeah, I, I'd be happy to, to do that, Susan, and also mention the fact that, um, you know, this is a moving target, you know, a few years ago we did no cell phones, then we went to 10 percent, this year we're going to 20 percent um, cell phones and doing, um, so we've doubled the number of cell phone uh, interviewing that we'll be doing in 2011 after having looked at not just our polling but, um, you know, uh, a poor, uh, the organization that most of us here uh, belong to um, did an analysis that I think to me was, uh, you know, uh, led, led to us saying that's the change that we need to make, we need to account for more. And who knows, you know, that's something we will, we will keep monitoring and we may, you know, need to increase even more. But we do waiting, uh, what we started doing last year uh, which we hadn't done before was waiting based on cell phone use for all of our surveys, not just some of them. Um, and so I think in, in many ways the cell phone issue is, um, is one of the most important we face um, in terms of reaching the population uh, that is uh, not just going to vote, but you know, um, uh, reaching the adult population in California. I, I agree, and I honestly, I think that the live interviewer method actually has big advantages over 
the IVR method when it comes to this critical problem. I, I mean, I think most of Jay's polls, if I can just put in a little dig since he did a few at me, uh, are local polls. And to my understanding, they don't do any cell phone interviewing in their local polls. So I think it's a big problem because I don't see how they get their samples of local polls uh, with cell phones. I mean, it's, it's a sampling issue. So uh, the, we have converted all the way over to uh, voter registration lists. That's naturally going up with every year. This, this year, 17% of the voters we contacted were on a cell phone. And we gave them the option to either do the survey on the cell phone or give us a landline or give us your work phone because we're sampling an individual. We have flexibility. I think that lends us some advantages in this period of transition. Jay may be right in 20 years. We may be all using our thumbs. But I'm looking at the next five. I'm not going to engage in this. I'm just going to tell you that 15, 1-5% of our respondents were reached on cell phones. And if Jane wants to elaborate, she can. The reason, and, and I, I have no reason to, to dispute the, the, what is it, NIH? NIMH um, that produces this estimate of the number of cell phones. Um, the, what we do with the USC College Los Angeles Times poll, we begin our sampling. Our sampling frame is the universe of cases of 17 million voters from which we sample. We buy, you know, 100,000 records and we go from there. And so it's a, it is a sample off of the voter registration file. You only get into our sampling frame if you are a registered voter. And on there are cell phone numbers as well as uh, landlines. Why 15% versus 25 is because voters are older and more voters will put on a home phone rather than a cell phone. So that's, I think, what accounts for the lower proportion to the extent that that 25% is correct. Um, we, we are just about out of time, but we started five minutes late. So I think if people need to go, please feel free to leave. Um, but if people would like, I, I see there's still quite a few number of hands. So uh, one more question. Um, Peter Schrag. Yes. And can you please wait for the microphone? Oh, okay. She's coming. Peter Schrag. Um, uh, you, you made a statement earlier, uh, Jane June, uh, that uh, immigrants don't come with uh, political uh, affiliations and so on. But isn't it true that all through the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s, the Democratic Party rested largely uh, on the votes of immigrants and their children because they were welcomed by the urban machines uh, of the Democratic Party and not very much welcomed by the Republican Party. Isn't, in fact, history now repeating itself? I, I, no, yes, I think that's right. Uh, but people from Guatemala or Singapore don't come here knowing that they're a Democrat or a Republican. So yes, you're right. It's a socialized response. And uh, to the extent that uh, parties welcome and provide services and other information to, to voters, this is that, that great democratic surge, the FDR generation, comes off the backs of immigrant voters uh, who were immunized into that particular party by their parents who were the immigrants who came over to, through New York and into the urban centers. So that, I think you're exactly right. Uh, well, I, can, I just, can I just say that I wouldn't say you're exactly right, because mm -hmm. there, are, there are other states that, that in which there has been exceptions to what you've uh, described as you know, an immigrant swing to, um, to Democrats or a Latino swing to Democrats. I mean, there were, uh, there were Latino Republicans that were elected um, around the country this year, you know, pardon me? Cubans. And Cubans, right, which is, was going to be my other point, which is that, you know, I think that one thing we've learned about the Latino vote is that, you know, you just can't say there's right. a Latino vote. Right, Because right. uh, when we look at it nationally, um, it's not, this, not necessarily what we've seen in California so far. Yeah, I, I, I think the phenomenon you're talking about is, is unique uh, and, uh, and to California. The, look, basically, the California Republican Party is viewed by people of color as not welcoming them. That's just the way it is. Not our fault. Republicans did it to themselves. And until they change that, and got, people like Duff Sunheim talk about this, until the Republican Party decides that it's not going to be viewed as very hostile to people who are not old and white, um, it's going to have a problem. I mean, they're at 31% registration, 20% independent. 
the rate they're going, they're going to become, uh, there'll be fewer Republicans and independents. They have to fix that problem. We're a minority white state. You all know that. But anyone else? One, one, last, one, one last, last question. Would you please use the microphone? Just a sense on, in the context of the 18 months prior to the general election, did you get a sense as you polled the state whether the federal debate on health care reform had an impact on your survey respondents and their candidates' choice? We did a fairly major poll, and actually we're going to do another one shortly. Every year for the past five years, we poll on uh, health issues for the California Wellness Foundation. Last year's poll was all about the Health Reform Act. It had just passed. What we found was that Californians were much more supportive than the public nationally. There was about a 12-point uh, support level in California that you're not seeing nationally, and there are reasons for that. Certainly, there are more Democrats and Republicans, highly partisan. But the ethnic populations are much more supportive. And also, there are more people who perceive themselves to be vulnerable on the health issue. We have higher numbers of the unemployed. More people think they are un uninsured. And more people think they might be uninsured in the future than is true nationally. So there are factors in play where health care is much more popular here, at least in our polls, than it is nationally. And it's, uh, it's an issue that would help. Of candidates. And let me quickly favor. add to that um, the fact that, again, as I mentioned before, we had the Schwarzenegger experience, which was different. Well, in this case, we also had the, the experience where the state was talking about health care reform well in advance and, and had um, really, in many ways, in a bipartisan fashion, embraced the idea of health care reform before. Uh, it got to the national level, and some of the things that Obama did were actually things that the Democrats in the legislature and, and Schwarzenegger um, had put on the table. They didn't make it, but it, it has had a lasting effect in how Californians think about health care reform. I agree. Great. And with that, uh, I would like to conclude the panel. Thank you to the panelists and to the audience. Thank you.